And welcome in AWA Unleashed. We are the preeminent self-proclaimed number one video stream and podcast dedicated to the Old American Wrestling Association. I am Chris Tubbs. We got a great show for you today. We're going to be doing something a little bit different and uh, we're going to have to take a little bit different approach because I, I feel like the topic and the content that we're going to have today, it's something that we've wanted to talk about, but there are certain ways that we need to go about it. And uh, that being said, let me bring in the uh, voice of Minnesota wrestling. And you know him from his days at ESPN. I know him from uh, here on the podcast, the one and only Mick Karch. Mick, how you doing? Well, you know, I, I've been better, but I always look forward to the podcast. And we're going to plow through this. And, yeah, very mm -hmm. interesting that you uh, that you said we have, have to take a kind of a novel approach here. But I'll yeah. explain that in just a couple of minutes. I know we got some some house cleaning stuff to talk about first. Yes, we do. First of all, uh, you see the hat from Soda Stick, uh, sodastickco.com. If you want, I'm gonna put the scroll down there, hoodie season, if you want your personalized hoodie, it's a black hoodie with the white logo and you can put your name on there. You can get it personalized. Go to uh, sodastickco.com, AWA Unleashed. Use the promo code Unleashed for 15% off. It's getting cold. It's hoodie season. And by the way, if you'd like the black and white, we've got the black and white t-shirt that is going to be available first at the AWA reunion number two coming up on October 29th. Mick Karch, he's going to promote that in just a little bit. Also, as well, if you love pizza and who doesn't like pizza, I got body by pizza. Uh, go to 7thAvenuePizza.com. The cool thing about it is it's great ingredients, it's fresh ingredients, but it doesn't taste like it's frozen. It's awesome. It's the best frozen pizza on the market. Uh, I like the Lucky 7. I also like what they call the meat sauce that's got the, uh, the meatballs and the pepperoni. Again, uh, look anywhere that you might be able to get uh, any of your uh, frozen pizzas. If you're not in the Twin Cities area, uh, go to 7thAvenuePizza.com. I want to thank uh, our sponsors right there. We've got other things coming down the pike. But uh, Mick Karch, tell us about what's coming up in, uh, I want to say, about a week and a half, a little over a week and a half. It is AWA reunion number two, Chris. As you said, it's going to be at the Embassy Suites out on American Boulevard in Bloomington, Minnesota. And this is going to be one hell of a ride in just four hours. We are going to have some fun. Uh, not only with the AWA wrestlers and personalities that are going to be on hand, we're going to have a raffle. We're going to have some trivia contests. There will be merchandise vendors, and it's from noon to four. And that is coming up October 29th, again, at the American uh, American Boulevard location for Embassy mm -hmm. in Bloomington. And just very quickly, going to give you the, the lineup. Uh, Nord the Barbarian, Pat Tanaka. Sodbuster Kenny J, Eddie Sharkey, Chris Curtis, Tom Rocky Stone, mm -hmm. Steve Olsonowski, Polish Joe Chupik, Chupik, uh, Princess Little Cloud, Derek Starfire Dukes, Gary Darusha, Lanise Hennig, uh, Kurt's widow, and then of course we are going to have a uh, a tribute to the Renslow family. Love it. Uh, they Love are going to be on hand, and uh, we got a lot of stuff going on. It is going to be so much fun. Go to the Slick Mick Old School Wrestling page or AWA Unleashed fans page, and that'll tell you how to get tickets. Get them ahead of time. Yes. Don't run the risk that you're you know, going to be standing up instead of sitting down. Yeah, because you've said, Mick, that seating is limited. Yeah. So you want to get your – if you're thinking about going, I recommend getting your ticket guarantee – your spot to sit your ass down that's what you want you don't want to stand you want to sit i'm just being honest mick you want well, to i know i do i don't want to stand ever <laughs> you don't want to stand yeah. don't stand sit don't walk run to get your tickets go you to your computer it. right there uh awa unleashed fans and a slick mick old school wrestling by the way that's not just all we've got planned uh we've got a couple other things that we're kind of working on i don't know if they're going to uh, to pan out but we still have uh card subject to change you got so it. we say is that is that fair to say that's the vernacular yes sir all right i just want to i just want to say it the way that they say it in the uh business yes, business correct. business or uh, however correct. you speak it okay so today we're going to talk about the best promos 
and interview segments in AWA history. And Mick, this is something that I kind of was thinking about that, you know, everybody's got these moments. It's like, oh man, I remember, you know, Mad Dog cutting this on Jerry Blackwell, or you know, I, I remember, you know, Mr. Sato attacking Hulk Hogan or, you know, anything uh, with Bruiser and Crusher or, you know, Nick or, or Keenan or anybody. But the, the thing about today is that because of rights, we do not have the rights to play the audio or the video clip. Right. Because those are copywritten, those are trademarked, and those are owned. So out of respect for those that own it and the fact that I don't want to get in trouble. I feel like we're doing the right thing. We are going to uh, give you some still pictures. But Mick, what I'm going to do, because there's a lot here that we're going to get to, I'm going to let you kind of start. And we've got a whole list of them. I'm going to let you start. And then I'm going to try and keep up and put some pictures up there. And we'll uh, we'll go back and forth a little bit. But hopefully I explained it. I, you can find some of these clips, you guys. You can find it on YouTube probably. If you Google, I know there's a, there's a couple of different pages. Just, you know, Google it on YouTube. Uh, I think it might be on Peacock, you know, part of the WWE Network. I don't know what they put out there in terms of right. when they made the move from Network to Peacock. I, I, yeah, I mean, that's just a that's a boondoggle in itself. But I'm gonna let you. Uh, I'm gonna let you go, Mick. And uh, you like the word boondoggle? I did. It's very good. Very See, good. You like that? It's an underrated word. Feel free to use the word boondoggle at any time. It's written down. We're, we're <laughs> ready to go. One thing I would say about these promos: this is strictly subjective. You know, yes. we've had thousands of promos over the years. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, there is no rhyme or reason to the order that we're putting these up. There's nothing chronological about it. No, it's it's not a ranking list. And, and some of the, this is also a lot of your suggestions as yeah. well. And, right, and exactly. we, we haven't gotten to, we probably didn't get all of them, but we took a bunch of your suggestions and incorporated this in here. So Yeah, it, it's going to be fun, and I'm sure a lot of them you will remember very fondly, maybe some not so fondly, but, uh, you know. You're going to do the impressions, right? You're going to do the impressions. When did I start doing that? I've never, never <laughs> done a new No. You kidding? <laughs> no, I've never done that. But this is going to be fun. We're going to talk about some of the, some of the more memorable ones. And you, as you said, we got some uh, still shots. So uh, we'll do the best we can, but we're going to trigger some memories. All right. Uh, let me see if I've got the right. Ready uh, there we go. There we go. Okay, here we go. All Three, right. two, and one. You're up, Mick. Here we go. This is This is one of the all-time great clips and i'm sure wrestling fans will remember when bobby heenan was being awarded the manager of the year trophy there you see the scene in the ring i believe bill after was uh, going to be giving him the the trophy uh he's in the uh in the ring bobby is with uh, nick bockwinkle and uh bobby the brain heenan and ray stevens uh, who's kind of behind roger kent there Things didn't go according to plan, and this had been set up for weeks where Bobby Heenan was interrupting Ray mm -hmm. Stevens every time Ray tried to say something on television. Uh, Bobby would interrupt him, and, and it came to a head. And, of course, uh, as happens quite a bit in professional wrestling, a trophy was broken. What? You're yeah, kidding. I, 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 I've, ne I've never known that to happen. That's something. Almost, almost as often as getting a, a birthday cake in the face. <laughs> Every now during his celebration, while, yeah. That <laughs> or, happened. But, or a uh, wedding going awry, yes. There you go. <laughs> but uh, Ray Stevens had the, uh, he had enough of being interrupted by Bobby the Brain. He then took the, uh, the trophy and smashed it over the ring post. And Bobby, of course, was livid. And Ray got a beat down from the Heenan family. And that set up a uh, Bockwinkle Stevens mm -hmm. feud. And I'm telling you, that broke my heart back in the day uh but nick and ray eventually got together reteamed again a few years later on but uh very very memorable indeed i love the slow burn like that and, and oh, that's yeah. always one of those you know one of those angles one of those stories that people they definitely remember no question about it now you know not a lot of uh, promos etc are really intense some of them are just kind of silly in their own right or the characters are memorable and Larry Hennig 
had a feud with Angelo King Kong Mosca. There's the big axe right there. Uh, Larry Hennig in his uh, in all his glory as the axe. And he was feuding with Angelo King Kong Mosca. Now, the, the world of professional wrestling sometimes disintegrates into name calling. I know it's hard to believe, but uh, but Larry Hennig, there's there's Big Ange, Angelo mm -hmm. Mosca, the big Italian tough guy. Uh, Larry Hennig went out on television, and maybe it was kind of playgroundish. But uh, he would go on to a rant where he would say, Angelo, ping pong, king kong, monkey, monkey <laughs> house, monkey man, banana ears. You call him every name in the book. Seriously. <laughs> it is right off the playground. And, you know, they got into a feud, a little little heated uh, feud. They wound up uh, in a football helmets match. Uh, Larry wore his son's uh, high school football helmet. And Angelo wore his helmet from his days with the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Uh, they had a football uh, helmet match, and Larry lost that one. Uh, but, yeah, ping pong, banana ears, monkey man, what, uh, dipshit, whatever he called him. <laughs> of course, Angelo Mosco was known for coming out during an interview, pulling out a comb, <laughs> yeah. those, those chest hairs of his. Uh, so between the chest hairs and the monkey ears and everything else, a uh, very memorable AWA feud, er, uh, mid 1970s Hennig and Mosca. The, the only thing that was missing is the I'm rubber, you're glue. You yes, know? yes. Or, you're rubber, I'm glue. I don't know. You know what I mean. I know exactly what you mean. Yep, yep. That's kind of degenerated to the childish area, but that's, that's great. That's what we love. Uh, speaking of name calling and so on and so forth, uh, the next, uh, there he is right there. There's my buddy, the late, great Kurt Hennig. And when Kurt turned heel, and of course he started feuding with the Ganya family, mm -hmm. particularly Greg Ganya. You know, Kurt's babyface promos were okay. There was, you know, nothing to write home about. But when he turned heel, there's Greg. There he is right there. He's got that red, white, and blue thing going. Man, just makes you want to sing the national anthem. But Man, anyway. that, 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 yeah, that that is the uh, penultimate white meat babyface, right? There you go. There you go. And proud of it. But Kurt came out for one particular interview, and I recall he said, can you imagine if you're Vern Gagne, you're an Olympic athlete, you're a heavyweight champion of the world, you're one of the greatest athletes Minnesota ever produced, and you find out your wife is pregnant and she's going to have a son, and you're envisioning this big six-foot-six, 300-pound six, tough guy son, and all of a sudden, you get this pipe cleaner that comes out with a neck like a stack of dimes. <laughs> That's the way he referred uh, to Greg Gagne. And, boy, they must have loved Kurt because it made the airwaves and they didn't edit it out. Uh, that was uh, shortly after or shortly before they actually did an angle on television where uh, Larry Hennig was going to be attached to Vern Gagne by a length of strap a 10 foot strap to keep the two of them from interfering in their son's match. And at some point during the promo, Larry yanks Vern really hard with this length of strap. And, you know, Vern loses his footing. And as Kurt is watching the video replay of that, he says, wasn't that great the way my dad pulled Vern Gagne out of his goodwill pen <laughs> roll? <laughs> so, the, uh, yeah, it, 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 fun. Uh, with the Ganyas, um, back in the day, that would be uh, early 90s, yeah. late 90s uh, with that feud. But great stuff. And that, <laughs> we mentioned before, that transcended TV. That yeah, and, and, yeah, and I mean, Kurt's, early Kurt, I don't think he gets the respect or maybe the admiration he should for the sort of quality of promos that he put. Because, I mean, people look at him, you know, when he made it the WWF run as Mr. Perfect. But some of those, just like one-liners, just like it was just like natural to Kurt to be able to just rattle off all of that and to be oh, able to look at that and the, the Goodwill Penny. It's like it all just seems so spontaneous, which is such an underrated art and a lost art in today's business. No question about it. And yet nothing scripted. They just went out there and did it. That yeah. was the beauty of it. No, it no question about that. All right, we're going to move on. And again, ladies and gentlemen, bear with us. We got screenshots as best as we can. Yep. 
And uh, why don't why, why don't we actually run this into two, Mick? Because I know we're. Is it okay if we we do uh, we break this up into two? Because I know we still got a bunch to go. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Right. So, so we're gonna we're gonna do two parts. I know we're 15 minutes into the first one, but I just feel like it's probably gonna be better off if we do we do two of them. So that way we're not I, rushing through. I would prefer that because we got stories to tell. Yeah. Uh, well, you got stories. I I just got little notes here. Well, uh, you know, it's close enough. Uh, what we're gonna talk about right now was really an intense interview. And this was Bobby Heenan again after Otto Vance. There you see Otto in all his glory ripping apart phone books. And I'm not going to denigrate Otto Vance for his strength. He really was a powerhouse of a guy. But that was one of the ways he was introduced to the AWA television audience was by, uh, you know, his ability to tear apart phone books. Otto won the championship from Nick Bockwinkel. In August of 1982, Bobby Heenan was not aware that the championship was going to change until the championship changed, which is really something. Uh, they didn't let Bobby in on it. And why, why, why do you feel they kept it so kayfabe, even away from Bobby? Because of the nature of the business deal, I, I think Vern just thought that maybe Bobby would object a little bit, you know, to uh, Otto Vance paying fifty thousand yeah. and and buying the championship. That's the only thing that I can think of. I mean, otherwise, why would you, why would you kayfabe a guy who was right in the middle of the angle? Mm -hmm. But I I remember vividly the promo that Nick and Bobby did afterward was in the locker room, and Bobby was one hundred percent intense, and he basically said. It, one simple move. Otto Vance reversed one simple move, and he said, everything we have worked for and strived for all these years is gone in a flash. Mm -hmm. I can't stand it. We're going to go to Stanley Blackburn. Uh, if, if you have an opportunity to see this on YouTube, it's a different promo from Bobby Heenan. And knowing what we know now, that mm -hmm. Bobby was not aware of the title switch till at, as it happened. It makes more sense. Absolutely. You can see the intensity and a little mm -hmm. bit of frustration and anger in Bobby's face. But boy, that was a classic, classic interview. And again, you guys, it's not that we don't want to show these clips. It's that legally we don't have the rights to these clips. So we're going to do the best that we can to kind of take you back through and set everything up. And and Mick's going to do what he can to, to kind of set the table for you. So uh, what when did Bobby find out about the whole title being bought by Otto Vance. Do, do you know when like word got out, maybe Bobby and others found out, or is it, am I just kind of asking for revisionist history? I think it, it was just probably after the fact. I don't know immediately okay. uh, right offhand, but my guess because of Bobby's reaction is that mm -hmm. they told him what the deal was and why it happened back in the locker room after it took place. And, you know, if, and I mean, if, if that's the case, you can certainly understand Bobby's consternation when he yeah. cut the interview. I don't know specifically, but I would guess that's how it, it played out. Okay. I just, I was just curious. No problem. Uh, we are going to go back to the 1960s. Let me make sure I am where I want to be. I certainly am. And the crusher surfaces a couple of times during our uh, best promos of all time. God knows. Boy, when you talk about the best promos in AWA history, Crusher is absolutely legendary with all the names he came up with for people and uh, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But he was feuding with Pompero Furpo, the wild bull of the Pampas. And this, again, is in the 1960s. And, and Pompero was a little bit ahead of his time in that he had the long – Locks. There he is right there. I think he's filing his teeth as well. Uh, either that or it's a, a Slim Jim, you know, before there were Slim Jims. I don't know. But but Crusher used to come out and say, Papiro Furpo has lizards, he has rats, he has mice and snakes in his hair that he uses to defeat opponents. Crusher accused Pompero of, of having all those foreign objects. <laughs> And thus, <laughs> Crusher came out with a spray can. I think it was a decon or raid or black flag, <laughs> something along those lines. 
And that was his weapon of choice. That was his foreign object against Pompero for both. And you know what? Mm -hmm. I get it. Yeah. I get it. I mean, you know, it's not just a simple case of a kid coming back from school and saying, you know, Tommy has lice. Pompero Furpo had a whole zoo. I was going to say he had lizards and mammals and fish and rodents and, you know. He did. And you know what? If you're going to believe anybody, you believe the crusher. I've always said that over the years. And, uh, again, that was that was very, very memorable back in the day. And uh, they had a great feud, just a tremendous feud. Furpo yeah. was one hell of a heel. Yeah, and, and he's kind of got that look, that that wild look, I think, before that really became a thing. Because I know some of yeah. us remember the later days with Brody, but I feel like he kind of he kind of transcended that, right? He kind of Absolutely. Pre- Absolutely. And Adam, here's another guy who came back as a babyface later on in the 1970s in the AWA, Pompero Purple. But, uh, yeah, that was just legendary, seeing Crusher coming out with the, you know, the old spray can. Uh, great stuff, but he did that so often, you know, tossing dog food at Mad Dog Vachon or vegetables at Killer Kowalski, whatever it was. But uh, great, great stuff. Uh, I know we're gonna we're gonna talk about Crusher again right away, and this isn't so much a promo as it was kind of a predecessor to later on in wrestling, where two tag team partners were so wild and uncontrollable during that interview, you never knew what was gonna happen. And that's Dick the Bruiser on the left, Crusher on the right, and they were allegedly cousins. Of course, you know, it was a a storyline in pro wrestling. But as far as I can tell, that was the first AWA tag team that at the end of the interview, the tag team partners would start shooting forearms at each other, uh, trading forearms across the chest and across the chin and so Mm -hmm. on and so forth. And, you know, fans that go into the later years when Mad Dog and Crusher teamed up, uh, they will know that Mad Dog and Crusher actually took it to another level, tried pulling each other's eyes out and nose hairs out and everything else at the end of an interview uh, when the tag team partners turned on each other. But it was only, it was recreational. It really wasn't a moment of anger. It was just, it was camaraderie, I guess was to beat the shit out of your tag it's, team. It's right? bonding. It, it's it's bonding, team building. That's what we're doing. You know, you know what? You're right. You're right. That's what that's why you're here. That's why I count on you. Mm-hmm. You know, it is it, for that. I'm more than just a pretty face and somebody who puts the pictures up, Nick. I mean, you know, it's you gotta create a culture, but I mean it, it just you got two guys that all they want to do is fight. That's pretty much what they want to do and they want to fight so much that they'll fight each other. The adrenaline was so high. The testosterone was bubbling over. <laughs> and, it, and it resulted in the tag team partners giving each other forearm shots as the camera went to black. Great you know, stuff. What, what, what are their favorite vegetables? Potatoes? Bada boom. You like that? Very, That's very good. That's my, that's my one. All no, right, that, we, that, that was really good. All right. Can, Moving on. Have we lost the audience yet? Or are we still here? Good. Uh, uh, well, they we're here. We're doing a show. We don't know if they're watching or listening or whatever. <laughs> you know, we're we're going to do the show whether or not anybody. That's exactly it. right. I'm liking this. <laughs> All right. So now here's a great angle. And we're talking about Sheik Adnan L. Casey, who had the managerial contractual rights to Ken Patera. And he wanted to sell those rights, or he offered to sell those rights to Bobby the Brain Heenan. And I believe, if memory serves me right, it was for a half million dollars. That's a hell of a lot of money to buy a guy's contract. And of course, Sheik Adnan came out and he had the he had the briefcase. And what was tremendous about this? Is that well, there? You, there you see Sheik Adnan and uh, Sheik uh, Sheik Jerry and Sheik mm-hmm. Jerry, uh, Lawrence of Arabia and uh, Sheik Ayatollah and Sheik Adnan. But when they made the transaction, mm-hmm. Bobby Heenan made a point, and I, I have always loved this. He wanted to make sure the wrestling fans understood what was going on, just in case the angle was lost on them. So Bobby said a couple, three times, so let me get this straight. You will give me $500,000 if I give you Ken Patera. Yes. 
But Bobby repeated it, and I believe he even did it phonetically, very slowly, so the wrestling fans would understand exactly what skullduggery had just taken place. Ooh, skullduggery. Another one. And, I mean, really, when you've got one heel manager selling the contract of somebody to another heel manager, I mean, I don't remember that really happening a lot either. You don't have those sort of intermingled angles, and then – yeah, you've got Blackwell and Patera as the sheiks. And, and it's just like, to me, it's like, how could these guys, after being, you know, you're not property, but you're aligned with the sheik and all of a sudden here you come out in all of this gear. I, I mean, it's it's just kind of shocking to me. that something well, that was all, He was all about money. You know that. Nah, that's that true. was all about the oil wells and everything else. You know, so so he didn't really care. You know, and, and Bobby Heenan, Bobby was giddy that he could actually procure the services of Ken Patera. So it was a win-win for everybody. But, but what stuck out to me was the fact that he had to explain it several times. Yeah. To make sure people understood who was buying who from who. Right. And, and that and, and you can do it in such a way that it continues to add because if you do it over and over, people are like, oh my God, okay, we get it. But Bobby Heenan was one of those guys that could say the same thing several times, and each time it felt like it was something new. Even there though you he go. was say he was saying the same thing, but it felt like he was saying something different. As opposed to us who just, you know, we ramble on and on and don't say anything. But that's true. Continuing on the Bobby Heenan vein. And uh, this is very, very memorable. And we've talked about this before. There was a guy who did a rock and roll gimmick back in the 1980s <clears throat> here in the AWA in the 70s and the 80s. And he actually got a big push uh, for doing it. And there is the end result. Now, I, I, I opted not to put a picture up of the rock star. And we've seen, you know, Bobby Heenan, you know, we'll, we'll see him periodically. Yes. But that is the end result Artist's conception, as they say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Artist> Bobby <laughs> Heenan taking the boombox from a certain guy and hammering it over the uh, the turnbuckle, the ring post. Uh, batteries were flying everywhere. Springs, Roger Kent had to get out of the way. Uh, Bobby was doing us all a favor. Uh, at the time, I don't know if, you know, old time rock and roll by Seeger was playing, but all of a sudden nothing was playing. And, uh, you know, Bud Zumhoff was a little bit, uh, oh, geez, I said it. Uh, the rock and roller was a little bit uh, upset, and certainly his uh, $29.99 uh, boombox was destroyed by Bob. Uh, probably, uh, probably a Casio, so he probably paid even more for it. Yeah, well, you know, maybe. Uh, I've said before, um, in all seriousness, Zumhoff caught a break because Bobby Heenan said, I'll work with the guy. I will work with this kid, and I'll get him over. I'll get the mm -hmm. rock all over and everything else. And he did it. But, you know, in the process, uh, Buck had to sacrifice that uh, that radio is. Yeah. No more Madonna. No. Yeah. Hey, he's more than uh, just a material girl. And, uh, by the way, I'm guessing where he's at, he's probably no longer a virgin. Hey, uh, hey, what? hey, hey. What? Come on. Come what? on. Anyway, uh, sorry. Uh, are are we going on? We're going on to number nine. Yes, we are going on to uh, to number nine, and uh, let's uh, let's get into uh, Jesse Ventura and uh, Adrian Adonis. Jesse Ventura, Adrian Adonis. This is the suspension where they lost a fall. There they are with me and Gene. Uh, Jesse and Adrian, they had lost the fall to Kenny J and George Scrap Iron Gadaski on AWA TV. And this was to set up their suspension. They were uh, pretty much done with their AWA run at the time. They were going out to WWF and uh, they had to be suspended. And the, the way they got them suspended was, of course, going berserk after they lost the fall beating the hell out of Kenny J and George Gadaski and, you know, the entire enhancement train that came into the ring. But they also, this is what tipped it right over the top. They attacked Wally Carbo. They went after Wally. As a matter of fact, uh, two things about this angle. Number one, uh, Adrian tried to rip Wally's sport jacket ahead of schedule. 
Uh, Wally wasn't ready for the rip job. And uh, Adrian, of course, grabbed the hold of it. It wasn't quite ready. It looked mm -hmm. a little awkward. And Al Darusha uh, was knocked to the canvas by Adonis and Ventura and no sold a kick to the head. So you had two classic moments. Did, did, that, did, Al, did Al not know what was going I mean, certainly. No, no, Al knew. Al knew. I, I think Al just didn't want to sell the kick. Because so, they were on their way out to WWF? Yeah, I, I guess yeah. so. So Al was on the canvas, and somebody kicked him in the head. I don't remember if it was Jesse or Adrian, and, and Al popped up like a yo-yo, like it didn't affect him. And uh, shortly afterward, uh, according to Wally, uh, yeah, I remember his words vividly, Adonis and Ventura, you are suspended and true. You are suspended and true. Not through, true. And they were gone. They were on the, uh, the next plane to uh, Brooklyn. So it was true that they yeah. were true. Yeah, was, that's right. Well, I, I guess so. Maybe that's what he meant now that you're, you know. It was true that they were true. I okay. Mean, I, makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, and again, uh, we've got a lot more. We're going to go about halfway here. Uh, I think we got another five or six, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, we'll kind of Cut Five or two. six listeners? Is that what we got left? <laughs> if we're lucky. Uh, oh, I, mean, oh, I mean, hold on. Uh, I only got one hand, so. Hey, hand you here know what? This is great stuff. And you know what, oh, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, I'm telling you, you're going to think about this and you're going to laugh. But anyway, yeah, so that's, uh, that was Wally Carbo being attacked by Adonis and Ventura. And did, I know that's out there on YouTube. Yeah, did, did anybody put their hands on Wally like before I me, mean, was he one of those guys that was off limits? Was was there anybody that you knew of, Mick, that was untouchable? Like, okay, we're going to do all of these angles. We're going to do these stories, whatever. But there's one person or one certain thing that you could not do that was taboo? Well, you would have thought so. But believe it or not, that's a segue into our very next uh, talking point. Boy, that, that, was, that, that was completely that was completely an accident. No, you did great. You Thank did you. great. Keep, keep having accidents. But Stan the Lariat Hansen, uh, his first appearance in the AWA, Stan, who I love Stan Hansen. And Stan, of course, we've said uh, many, many times is as blind as a bat. This was one of the excuses, of course, he used when he went berserk on television. And Wally Carbo jumped up on the ring apron to try to get Stan's attention. And Stan came over. There's big Stan. And he clocked Wally Carbo, knocked him ass over tea kettle, off the ring apron. Wally's sport coat was, was flying. He looked like a, a, I don't know what, like a 747 <laughs> uh, coming in upside down for a minute. <laughs> I, and, I, I and, don't know. I don't know why that 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 visual is funny to me. It, it yeah, shouldn't. Now, it shouldn't be, but Wally, it was. Wally took a big bump for Stan. Is basically what I'm trying to say here, and uh, and, and that was that was a no no at the time. And Stanson, uh, Stanson, Stan Hansen's excuse. <laughs> Stan Hansen's excuse. Stanson. Besides the fact that he couldn't see a foot in front of him was. It was his first time in town. He didn't know who the hell Wally Carbo was. And it could have been just a crazed fan that got up on the ring apron and posed a threat to Stan Hansen. And Stan had to take care of business. Now, I don't know how threatened Stan could have been. I mean, Wally's pot belly got up yeah. on the ring apron 15 minutes before Wally did. <laughs> so I'm not sure how, how Stan felt like there was any kind of a, a real physical threat there, but the man clocked Wally Carbo. So there you go. Again, untouchable Wally. We've got we got Hanson taking a shot yeah. at him. We've got Adonis in Ventura. Later on, Vern took a shot at him in court. Just everything happened to Wally Carbo. All right. We have a do you have another Stan Hansen story here? You know, the, the one I would talk about with Stan Hansen is a, a, a common used phrase of Stan's where he was ex explained to everybody, whether it was Rick Martell, Nick Bockwinkel, whoever, that he would do anything he could do. And I'm sure Stan used this promo all over the country because the business was all about making money and Stan had a fat life 
and nine kids at home, and he had to feed them. And that is exactly why Stan Hansen, you can, you can understand it now. Yeah. And to me, Stan was trying to take care of the folks at home, the fat wife, and nine kids, and you do what you got to do. You know, and I'm sure Stan used that promo in virtually <laughs> territory. I don't know how they took to it in Japan, but uh, <laughs> how he explained it. But uh, one of my all time favorites is Stan Hansen. What uh, a see, I bet if he had a thin wife, he wouldn't have been so angry and beating people up all the time. Well, I'm not going to go there. I, I'm going to do uh, the, the PC thing and not body shame. No, I'm not body shaming. He called his wife fat. I, I, I mean, maybe if you didn't have a fat wife, you wouldn't need to feel the need to get yourself suspended and fined. And, you know, uh, you know I, I can't do the Wally thing because you can do it better than I can. I'm not even going to try it because I'm going to look like a dork if I try it. Let's move ahead. Yes, uh, let's I, move I, ahead. I know that, uh, you know, the, the one listener who's still here probably wants us to get going. Thank you. Uh, God bless my son. But anyway, uh, we're going to talk about back in, I believe this was 1984. Uh, I don't want to swear to the year, but there was a little incident at a McDonald's restaurant in Waukesha, Wisconsin, involving uh, Ken Patera and Mr. Saito. And uh, there they are right there. And uh, some Waukesha police officers, and, you know, it's been talked about many, many times, so we won't do it again here. And I know Ken doesn't like hearing about it, so I'm not going to go there. But uh, they were both away from the AWA for a little bit after this uh, particular incident. And I, I recall when Mr. Saido came back, Jesse Ventura, uh, who was teaming up with Saido at that point, the Far East West Connection was explaining Saito's training regimen. He said he's been away. He's been working out real hard. He has even resorted to letting people hit him in the knees and the shins with billy clubs as part of his training. And that is the way <laughs> that, uh, that Jesse kind of made light of what was really a serious incident uh, but it was all over the place. Everybody knew that it was going on. So, yeah, Jesse explained the training regimen of uh, Mr. Torture uh, as, as saying part of it was being hit in the knees with billy clubs. Oh, man. Leave it to Jesse. Leave it to – yeah, li leave it to Jesse. That's pretty much the only thing that you can say, leave it to Jesse. Yep. All right. Uh, we are Ready? on – more? Yeah, we'll do uh, – let's do two more because uh, we'll end on the one that – I had kind of told you is my personal favorite of all time. Yeah. Uh, so we'll end on that one. And again, we're going to come back next week. We're going to do part two because we've still got a bunch of these. And we could have probably gone maybe 30 to 45 seconds on each, but then you don't really get like the story part that, that you want to, you know, if I got some crazy ass follow-up question or something. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a couple more, then we're going to cut it off and then we're going to come back. And then we're going to do part two for next week. So that's kind of where we're at here. That is that. And again, for those that if you're wondering why we're not playing the clips or, you know, why we don't have the audio, we don't own the rights to it. And this is a situation that we would love to be able to, to just throw those up there for you and take them off and kind of react. But the problem is we don't own those rights. So uh, what we'll do is, you know, we're setting it up. Uh, putting the pictures up and Mick is kind of telling those stories. So it, it might be a little disjointed in that respect, but uh, you know, we're going to be respectful of everybody's trademark and copyrights. And uh, we're going to do what they get just like we would want people to be respectful of ours. At the same time, we want to be respectful of those that actually own it. So uh, that being said, uh, we, I know we don't, we don't want to be sued is what you're no, saying. You know, we certainly don't want that, especially when our business lawyer hasn't completed his 30 years yet at Stillwater, you know, That's he hasn't yeah. rolled yet. So we're in, we're not in a, in a position to, you know, well, uh, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for you to come up with the bail money. That's what <laughs> you told me. You told me you were going to come up with the bail money. Oh wait, no, that's the money that, Oh no, that's the money that you lost 
for uh, for Vern because you ran him out of business. That's right. Um, you're an ass. You know that you really do. Yeah, I mean you just all right. Anyway, uh, let me tell you. Oh, I know what we're going to talk. We're going to talk about Larry Nelson. Sure. Larry Nelson. God, I loved Larry Nelson. I loved working with Larry. He had so much enthusiasm almost to a fault. And that is probably why Larry has made the uh, the most memorable promos list. There you see it right there. There is the blaster. And it, it's funny how many people in AWA TV land remember this particular moment. Mm -hmm. And it was just a blip. It was a blip on the radar. The blaster really never went anywhere in the AWA. But Larry was talking to Al Darusha promoting upcoming stuff. And all of a sudden, the blaster blasts through the interview backdrop. And Larry Nelson, let's just say this. When Larry sold something, um, you, you kind of liken it to Larry having an orgasm. I've, and that's, that's fun, not funny thinking about Larry and orgasms, but that's the word that a lot of uh, people, when they mention Larry, they said the orgasmic reaction that he had during some of his interviews. And that the, the blaster one is kind of the one that you're saying everybody points to. I think this was the, this was the one, this was the penultimate. This is the one that, that really, uh, I believe if I recall correctly, Larry jumped up and down in place and said something to the effect of what in the blue eyed world, which is interesting. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. yeah, don't hear that too often. You ruined the set. You broke the backdrop, whatever it was. Uh, but Larry, Larry's eyes were bugging out of his head even more than the blasters were. And which is kind of interesting. And thus, I think that's where they get the, mm -hmm. you know, the orgasmic reaction. Mm -hmm. Something was going on there with my friend, Larry Nelson. I'm not sure what it was. But something happened at that moment. Was it just a little, was he a little too excited to oversell it? I mean, was he trying to get the character over, though? I, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Oh, yeah, yeah. was he a little bit <laughs> overexcited and oversell it? Of course, yes, you think? I mean, if you to take the man's, the man's belt buckle was hitting his nose, he was jumping up and down so hard. I don't think there was a little bit of an oversell there. You know, especially for a, a guy who didn't even make it to mid-card status <laughs> in the AWA. I don't know if, if Vern ever actually patched the hole in that backdrop. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure that yeah. ever happened. But yeah. anyway, come out of those those moments, now we're going to go to your favorite to wrap it up for this. Yeah, program. I think this one is probably, I don't know if it's everybody. This is the one to me that when I think of the iconic promos, it, to me, it's hard to pass up the one that we're going to bring up because I felt like it was such a, you couldn't get any more extreme or any more serious than building a coffin for somebody. This was one of the most extraordinary interviews in AWA history, and everybody remembers it. There he is right mm -hmm. there. That is our buddy, the late truly great Maurice Mad Dog Bashan, and he's building a coffin, a casket for his arch enemy at the time, Jerry Blackwell. And of course, it was Jerry Fatwell, according to the dog. Now, a couple of things. First of all, uh, I, I'm not sure how the dog is building that. He seems to be kind of indiscriminately hammering. I'm not sure if there is. Yeah, and things are falling apart. It's like yeah, for yeah. every little bit that he hammers, Wood's supposed to be going on there. You're not supposed to hammer it and wood fall off. I, I, I'm not quite sure, but, you know, things are splintering all over the place. Plus the fact that, you know, I, it looked like that casket could have held Sky low. low. <laughs> I don't know, you know, you, you're going to build a, a, a casket for Jerry Blackwell. You may want a little bit more wood than that. Maybe George Gadaski took it out, you know, from Burns training camp out to his farm and there wasn't enough plywood. He but, probably used some of that plywood. Maybe Vern was going to patch up the hole from the from the uh, the blaster. It, it full circle. For the but, but this was so intense. I mean, we make light of it now, but the dog was so believable. He was basically mm -hmm. saying Jerry Blackwell, and I, I can't do the dog. 
Uh, Jerry Blackwell, one of us has to leave this world. It's not big enough for the both of us. And I believe he used the phrase to boot. Uh, yes, yes. A, a couple of times during that interview, yep. which, which he explained something to the effect of, you know, it's all over, death, uh, you know, mortality is, is coming. Um, it was such a tremendous interview that it has had lasting impact 40 years later. Yeah. Uh, one of the dog's legendary interviews, and I think one of the great moments, the camera's on the dog. He's hammering away at this casket. Gene Okerlund walks onto the set, and the dog says, how did you fight find me? me? Yes. Well, you know, that <laughs> dog must have been so intent on building that casket that he didn't see the lights, <laughs> the cameraman, the boom microphone, didn't see any of that. He was focused. Focused. He was focused. He was he was absolutely ingrained mm -hmm. in what he was doing, building that coffin until Mean Gene arrived on the scene. But I'm telling you, in AWA history, I don't blame you, buddy. That is one of the all-time classics, Mad Dog Vachon and Jerry Fatwell. It's a pine box. There you go. I will say when I watched that promo, because I just watched it again just a few days ago, just because I, I wanted to, you realize how close Gene Okerlund was when Mad Dog's got that hammer? You see where Gene is at? I feel like it's going to go back and it's just going to impale Gene in the side of the head. I'm like, I, I mean, I felt Gene had to be careful with that. Mad Dog was one of those guys along with Terry Funk and maybe Stan Hansen, you know, get out of the way. Yeah. You know, I, I'm going to cut a, a believable promo here. And if you happen to be a casualty, your collateral damage, that's that's the way it goes. But you know what? It's going to put asses in the seats. You might not be there, but uh, <laughs> a, a big crowd will be great. Great. <laughs> yeah, it, it was absolutely phenomenal. So, uh, again, we're going to cut it short here, you guys. And we still got a bunch more to get to of some of the best interviews and interview segments, promos and whatnot. And uh, a few of them that maybe didn't hit the mark uh, their first time. So we're going to get to that uh, coming up next week. But before we let you go, you can see the uh, soda stick, the skull hat. Uh, you can see the uh, the yep, soda clothing company right there that Mick's got. Uh, SodaStickCO.com. If you're looking for a uh, something to wear now that it's getting colder, uh, hoodie season, we've got the personalized hoodies. With the uh, black with the white logo, you get your name on the collar. SodaStickCO.com. Use the promo code UNLEASHED for 15% off. By the way, guys, coming up in a week and a half, we've got on October 29th, Nick's going to tell you about it here in a minute, AWA reunion number two. People have been asking for, it's like, I like the t-shirts, but I don't want to wear white. That's cool. You can be like my ex-wife who should never wear white. You can wear the black oh, wow. with the white. You can get it the very first time you can get it at the reunion coming up October oh. 29th. What? Oh. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> what? Go ahead. Spin facts. Go I'm ahead. Trying to, keep, I'm trying keep to I'm, I'm, I'm trying to well, I'm trying to promote the 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 thing and you're yeah, okay. Sitting, okay. All right. So <laughs> I'm going to take you off screen because I can't, I can't focus with you there. There we go. Uh, now nah, I took you out of the stream too. But if you're going to go to the uh, the reunion, you guys, you can get the black T-shirt with the white logo, just like we have on the hoodie. Very first time you can get it October 29th in person. Uh, Soda Stick is going to be there. Uh, and uh, we're going to have those exclusively uh, right there. So, uh, all right, Mick. Um, you're up. October 29th, he mentioned the date. It's the Embassy Suites, American Boulevard in Bloomington, Minnesota, from noon to 4. You say you're AWA fans, prove it. If you're in the Twin Cities area, come on out and support the guys that entertained you all those years ago, whether it was in the main event or the opening match, mm -hmm. behind the scenes, whatever. Pay tribute to the uh, legacy of the AWA. I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to talk all about it. Uh, I, tremendous. Yeah, they're they're, I, they're so making themselves, yeah, they're making themselves available for you guys. Like yes. they are blocking out this day exclusively 
for fans. Yep. And and it's I mean it's 25 bucks, oh, which gets you in deal. the door. You get an hors d'oeuvre uh, buffet. Correct. You get that. You get a guaranteed place to sit if you're one of the you know first 250. Uh, but you Mick, you said seating is limited, and you've got people that I I'm going to show up. The thing is, you want to get there because if you if you don't purchase early, you run the risk of not getting a place to sit and not getting because uh, the the seating's limited, the food is limited. So I would advise people to go to the AWA Unleashed fan page if you're not a fan uh, of the page. Subscribe, you know, submit. You know, Brandon does a great job. Brian and Jeremy, like we've got, they do a great job with that fan page. Go ahead and, and just like it and get in on the community uh, or a slick mix old school wrestling. But get your tickets, and, and it's not just a normal ticket push here. This is—I don't want you guys to be left out because everybody loves the podcast. Here's your chance to get to meet these guys and girls in in person. I mean, here's your chance. Don't miss out on it because this might be the last opportunity we have a chance to bring this group together or not. We, you, I was going to say that, you know, not to be maudlin, you know, um, but let, let's face reality. There's mm -hmm. not a lot of AWA guys left. Some of them were not available to come to the reunion. Uh, others absolutely, as you said, made themselves available Yes. But whatever, ladies and gentlemen, come on out, you know, give them a round of applause, shake hands with them, pose for those pictures, and relive the memories of the AWA. So there you go. Again, all of the ticket detail on the AWA Unleashed Fans page, Slick Mick Old School Wrestling. Uh, that being said, Mick, we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to cut it off here. I know we've got some... Uh, we got some shout outs and whatnot. We're going to do that next. Uh, we're going to do that next week. So uh, we'll cut it off here and we'll come back next week with part two of the interviews and promos and the segments and all that stuff. Sound good? Sounds good to me, bud. Cool beans.